So uh, I'm going to tell you all a little bit about an experience I had, a little bit about my life, and um, I would really like to have you all ask some questions because I'd like to make this a little interactive, and um, I'll probably give you a little shorter than normal talk about what I've uh, gone through. Uh, before I mention, before we get into this, I want to mention some things Matt said. Uh, it really struck me. Uh, number one, curiosity. You really want to know life? You want to know what makes you tick? You want to know higher things? Don't be afraid to ask. Because if you don't ask, if you don't seek, you get whatever tumbleweeds and situations life happens to bring your way. So be proactive, ask. And then the other question is how do you get your answers? Well, you're probably going to never get a little note floating down from heaven from God that gives you instructions. You get feelings. You get thoughts, you get intuition, you get to learn to read the signs. And that's one of the things, reading the signs, that I was fortunate enough to learn through my experience. I'll give you a little bit of background about myself so it makes sense, or hopefully it makes sense. Uh, I was raised Catholic as a child. I'm the third of seven brothers. I have two brothers born exactly a year apart. Older than me, December 8th, 1945 and 46. They're both a double and a triple Sagittarius. And here I come on November 8th, 1947, a very hypersensitive Scorpio dealing with these two Sagittarians who've had their whole lives. And my dad is a Sagittarius. Woo! And I grew up under a lot of fire. Now, one thing I learned pretty young is that I don't play that game. I'm not one of these macho guys that pounds the chest. So, uh, you know, about three-fourths of the clutter in life I was not interested in. Sports, you know, I'm a pretty healthy guy except for the back problems, but uh, I didn't want to go play sports or bang heads with men. I just go home and have that, you know. <laughs> uh, my two brothers had a profound effect on me. They were beautiful people. One passed away just a couple of weeks ago, uh, and he's in heaven. And, um, but they had a profound effect on me because uh, I think at a very young age, I started realizing that I was able to see things that were going to happen, and it weren't, didn't take us nuclear science to figure it out because they were pretty blatant. But I started developing a sense of awareness as a kid, couldn't quite understand it. Um, raised Catholic, I certainly wanted to go to heaven. I became an altar boy, I used to know the whole mass in Latin, I'll be in Queen Latifica, Tutip, whatever. I uh, got out of high school, went to college, started studying electrical engineering, and I was always curious about God as a young kid, about uh, truth, about, you know, heaven and hell, and I never, never bought into the hell thing. I don't care how young I was, I just went, no loving God is going to throw anybody in burning hell for eternity. Give me a break. If you want to believe that, fine. You can believe that the world's flat, it ain't. You know? So anyway, well, by the time I got to college, I was very interested in, in God and religion and life. And I've you know, talked to a lot of different people about their religions, their beliefs, and so forth. Um, and I met a lady, actually, um, anyway, I met this lady that uh, was a horse, that was an astrologer. And as an electrical engineer, I didn't quite believe in that, but she did the chart for me. And a week later, I met her back at the student union, and she told me all about myself. And it was uh, pretty interesting because, like I said, as an engineer, it didn't quite make sense to me, but it triggered my uh, interest. And through her and some other people, I started reading a lot about Edgar Cayce and Madame Blavatsky and different psychics and spiritualists. And uh, by the time I got out of college um, in 1970, I was uh, profoundly down that road. <laughs> you know, this organized religion is nice and convenient and maybe stops people from being too crazy, but it's very limited, and I knew that, and I wanted more answers, and I was, as Matt said, curious. The most healthy thing you do in life is ask questions. I got out of college. Um, I'd start playing guitar way back in 1963 or so, before, you know, uh, Jimmy Reed, Ray Sharp, people like that, Freddie King. All through college and high school, I played in bands, uh, and one thing that was very apparent to me, and everybody who heard me, is I'm a crappy singer. I just never had the good voice. Had all the passion. Got out of college, electrical engineering, 1970. It was all defense work. 
I was a conscientious objector. I served two years as a uh, working at the Austin State School uh, and did not want to go into engineering because it was all defense work. I decided, well, I'm going to play music. So I started playing music. And um, there's a reason I'm mentioning this. I went through a lot of depression in my 20s because I had a crappy voice and it was hard to get with the bands I wanted. You know, it really was. Uh, I found work, but it wasn't always, you know, the best bands that one could have played with, and sometimes I was embarrassed to tell people where I was playing, but it paid part of the um, I was traveling on the road a lot. 1977, I quit traveling on the road for a lot of reasons. And this is the start of this near-death experience I had. I'd never even thought about these kind of things, but uh, the day I ended our tour, I, I was started, uh, came back to the duplex. I just moved in there a couple, five, five or six weeks earlier. Two roommates, uh, I knew them both a little bit, but not near as well as um, perhaps I would learn. <laughs> uh, the first night I came back, I noticed I started hearing things before people would say them. A friend that was at the house wanted to borrow a vacuum cleaner, I heard him say that. And then about some attachments, and both times I said, Did, didn't you just say this? And he said, no. But the next day, I woke up, I couldn't sleep at all that night. I woke up the next day after a whole night of feeling different. Things felt different. I, something was going on. I was going through my whole life. Woke up in the morning, well, wake up, got up in the morning, my roommate's coming in with a newspaper and he's reading it, and I instantly saw the headlines through his eyes. It was an article about Jimmy Carter, 1977. Boy, that shocked me. And he threw the table down on the the paper down on the table in front of me, and of course I could see that it was exactly what I had just seen, and I'm kind of uh, staring at it, mesmerized. Yes, you okay? Uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That day, he and my other roommate left, and I started unpacking stuff and feeling the people who'd given me these things or where I'd been in profound clarity like never before. I could relive the same time and place that I got this item. And this went on until about then and it was driving me crazy. So I walked down to the store and I started realizing I'm picking up thoughts with everybody. And this is the first, actually the first or second day, depending on how I want to calculate this, of this um, extraordinary, all of a sudden life is very different. That night we went to a, uh, my roommate and I went to a club, Soap Creek Saloon. I don't know if any of you guys are here long enough to remember that. Joe Ely was playing. We were in the back room and it got too intense for me. I was picking up everything about everybody. Couldn't take it. Walked outside, sat at the bar. Could pick up things about people walking by. Uh, and then I thought, boy, I need a break. I go take a step outside. And as soon as I had that thought, I felt like I was standing outside in the same place where coming in 30 minutes earlier, I had gotten a strange feeling. So this is like strange feelings on top of strange feelings. But I went from closing my eyes, sitting at the bar, feeling like I was all of a sudden outside the bar, and I saw these people walk right through me, and that shocked me, and I opened my eyes, and I'm still in the bar, and there's the bar door, and it opened, and they walked through, dressed exactly as I had seen a second ago. And I thought, this is kind of strange. Let's see if I can do that again, and I could. And after three or four times of actually projecting myself outside at Will, sitting in a bar stool, my roommate comes in. What have you been doing? And I thought, oh, he'll never believe this. So I said, I'll bet you five bucks I can tell you who's coming through next, what the dress like. And I sure, well, I won twice. He couldn't believe it. He couldn't believe it. He just won it all. At first he said, you've been, you've been standing here. These people, you just went outside. You've asked these people, no? Ask them all. This was day two. By day three and four, I couldn't even remember what normal life was like. I really could not. I was totally, totally taken over by this instantaneous, here at the millisecond, awareness of everything like I've never had in my life. I could be listening to the radio and certain words would jump out as, as if uh, accentuated for me to hear them. Maybe everybody else, I didn't know. Uh, and everything had to do with either my personal part in life situation or the whole universal 
change of consciousness, but it wasn't trivial, just about the music and what's next. It was all symbolism. Uh, I'll give you an example of what I went through. There's several in the book. This went on for a solid week before I actually had the near-death experience, which explained what I was going through. Um, there was no neutral. I would, by the second or third day, I could either feel or interpret or see things before they're going to happen or read signs, or I could project thoughts onto something, but there was no neutral. And when there's no neutral in life, you can't just relax for two seconds. I've never thought about that way, but I couldn't. Everything was on full talent all the time. So I either had to observe things, or I started, in order to not be bombarded with that, I started thinking, uh, well, maybe I can, the relationship between me and the external world it became pretty obvious in these last two or three days. So I remember I was in Dallas seeing a friend, and I, I'd look at a complete stranger three blocks away, and I would think, uh, scratch your head and point up to the top of that building and they would do it. And I got incredible chills. Did I know that person was about to do that? Or did I pick it up? Or did I make it happen? I'd look at a random car and think, turn left at the next intersection. I remember one lady swerved over three lanes and honk and I thought, God, I gotta be careful. Did I make that happen or is she just gonna turn there? I couldn't tell the difference. I literally could not tell the difference between what I was witnessing and I was creating. This is about day four or five. Um, my friends, my roommates were very concerned about me because I wasn't sleeping and I was 24 seven up to the millisecond news about everything in the world uh, and telling them all sorts of things, who would call next and, and you know, I'd sit out on the porch and I could see cars, come, hear cars coming up and I could tell what kind of car it was, read the license plate and tell all about the driver to my roommate sitting right next to me before the car came into view. And I could do this over and over and over, and I was never wrong. That scared the pure hell out of me. It really did. I, by the fifth and sixth day, it was just almost unbearable in fear on one hand and ecstasy on another. Wow, I didn't know people could pick this up. But it was still pretty hard type of to, to, to walk. I had to constantly keep myself as best as possible in balance. So I, wouldn't, I felt like if I fell asleep or closed my eyes or lost attention, if I happened to be that one person in the whole universe that's carrying the candle of all life for everybody and everything, and I fell asleep on the job, the whole universe would collapse, and guess whose fault it would be? I mean, that's a pretty serious sense of responsibility, but there's some truth behind all that. Um, I'll give you an example of a couple things, like one time we were in a restaurant, the uh, filling station that used to be in Austin, Texas, and my roommate was with me and he was saying, "How this is about the third or fourth or fifth day, how is things going now? Because he was watching me going through this un unknown uh, change of consciousness. And again, rather than explain to him, I said, I'll show you what I'm going through. This is, and I looked at Far over as I could to the corner of the restaurant, saw these two ladies, one of them looking away from me and one of them, neither of them looking at me. Uh, and I asked him if he knew them. And he kind of looked at me and said, no, why? And I said, I'm gonna have the brunette write me a letter. He said, what? I said, I'm gonna have the brunette write me a letter. Well, what are you gonna ask her to say? I don't care. So we start eating and all the time we're eating, no matter what he's saying, I'm thinking in terms of that brunette. I'm not looking that way, I'm not walking that way. It's very harmless. Just come up and write me a letter. I mean, how absurd would that be if it happened? Five minutes later, the two ladies came by, and the second lady, the brunette, who was facing away from me, who I kept saying, I'm the guy over here in the blue shirt, write me a letter. She had written down a napkin in these big, bold letters. Why are you doing this to me? You think that didn't scare the hell out of me? And my roommate, and, and this went on. And this went on, and I got to the point by the eighth, seventh, eighth day, it was completely beyond control. I was walking. I had felt these monitors. They felt like guardian angels. I felt them for about, you know, the whole time this started building up. I couldn't see them. They seemed to be kind of in shifts, like two or three, or, but they seemed to be, uh, they seemed to name themselves the monitors as if they were guardian angels or protectors or something, and they really gave me comfort. Several times I could feel them, 
and um, like protectors. So at the end of eight days of this absolute unbelievable intensity I was going through that I could not cut off, believe me, if I knew where the button was, I would have pushed it off. Uh, I didn't know there was a button. I didn't know what I was going through. I knew it was escalating every day, and I knew that it was not like normal life anymore, and I knew it was getting real hard to deal with this. At the same time, it was fascinatingly uh, beautiful and profound. So at the end of eight days of this, um, long story short, I'm walking down Guadalupe. I'm well, walking, I'm racing, I'm terrified, I'm crying, I'm praying. I completely lost it. God help me. You know? And there's people around the um, street at night at 7 o'clock at night, about 6.37, something like that, on February 7th, 1977. I'll never forget it. Uh, and I had just lost it and I was crying and praying and begging God to help me and uh, closed my eyes once and all of a sudden everything felt incredibly warm. My fear instantly disappeared instantly. And I, what the hell? And I felt this warmth around me. And I opened my eyes and there was this huge light coming down right on my head. And my first thought was, well, if I had a ladder, I could climb up and touch it. It's six feet ahead of me, not four, not ten. It was physical. And it was like a big spotlight. And I looked around at all these people standing around me who had been watching me cry uh, and, and pray. And they were real concerned, but they didn't react to this light at all. It's like they didn't see it. And I kept thinking, oh boy, how can they fake this? <laughs> oh well, whatever. And I looked back up and the light then appeared as a big, like a crystal table. It was about that thick. I remember the specific thicknesses of things because they weren't just sort of there. They were physical, at least to me. And uh, as I looked up at this crystal table, looked through it, I realized there's these seven white robed guardian angels looking down at me. And they said in one voice, do you trust us? And I said, absolutely. Whoever you guys are, whatever's going on, absolutely. I don't understand what's going on. They said, you will. Do you trust us? And I said, you're the monitors. I realized these were the guardian angels who had been watching me. And they said, yes, do you trust us? Meanwhile, people around me are watching me talk to an empty sky. And <laughs> I could care less. Uh, I was so thrilled by the feeling these monitors. Within seconds, I was hit by a speeding car. And I was on my feet. And it's a long story. I don't want to go into it. Uh, but what should have killed me, I didn't even hurt. I did not even feel the impact. Uh, the last thing I saw as my eyes rammed into the um, grill, the hood of this car, was the headlight. And you know how you look at a light and you close your eyes and the little dot stays on your retina, you know? Well, that happened when I hit it. The impact forced my eyes closed or I closed them or something. And the little dot that had been from the headlight instantly was the big bang. And I thought, I just saw the big bang. But my first feeling was it wasn't just this. This is not just the one big bang. This is one of infinite big bangs. And at that same time, I'm standing I'm above my body, looking down, watching it getting tumbled, smashed up by this car, people screaming it. And within a second, I noticed I was expanding out in all directions, like a balloon, not like an arrow. Soon the whole earth became a little ball this big, and I'm looking at it from 360 degrees, north pole, south pole, all directions at once. That thought would have never even occurred to me. But here I am looking at it. And because I felt like my consciousness or soul or something, not my physical body, was sitting on the on Guadalupe Street, but my consciousness was expanding and everything was going inside of me, and, and galaxies and the planets and this happened so fast that the difference between sequential things and spontaneous things uh, became hard to decipher. It was all simultaneous or sequential. It was all happening once. There was no time. I expanded to the edge of the universe, which uh, seemed like a thought rather than something that was actually physical created. 
And as I went through this age of the universe, I experienced what seemed to name itself as the colors. It was a level of consciousness that, that we would come to this planet, we use in order to use our thoughts, our feelings, our senses in order to connect with cosmic consciousness, God, the universe, whatever. Uh, all of a sudden I'm outside of this universe and there's infinite universes and it's, it's looks like a sky full of stars as far as you can see and then they turn it into this big spinning tunnel of light, which is the best way people can describe it and I'm being shot through it. By the, now by this time I have no awareness of me, I have no awareness of Earth, I have no awareness of creation, I just have sensation and it is beautiful. I just can't believe this. Where am I going? I've never felt such ecstasy and fearlessness, pure joy. Then it felt like I was kind of shot out of the other side, like, like a clown on one of those balloon, um, you know, circus things. But I ended up in this infinite blue void. And it was everything and nothing. It was simultaneous infinite creativity and infinite possibilities, but all within the realm of thought. Nothing had actually been created. It just seemed that way because this divine, infinite thought of infinite creativity could imagine anything and it would be. Uh, so the difference between what was actually created in this time or space or any time and space and the infinite mind uh, was uh, it's hard to distinguish between them, uh, which gave me a very good comprehension when I came back about my and this being the illusion of separateness because I felt no separateness there in this infinite mind. And yet I was witnessing every possibility on every planet, on every galaxy, and so much information so quick it was just, um, couldn't really separate it, couldn't really, didn't have time to grok it too long. But one thing I felt, and this was most people who've had NDEs or out-of-body experiences have felt this, is infinite love. And I realized infinite creativity is a byproduct of this infinite love. And while I'm observing all this beauty and majesty, somewhere in this process, it felt like I was witnessing it instead of being at one with it. And instantly I pulled away from it, and I didn't particularly want to leave. It was a pretty nice spot to be in. But I was pulled back through this tunnel of light and went through this, saw this whole starry sky of infinite universes and was drawn to one of them, which was this one, with no aware, awareness of where I'm going or why, just where I've been and what I'm leaving. So as I, and I, I couldn't control this, I couldn't stop it. It's like the, I use the term spiritual gravity in my book, it kept pulling me, pulling me back to somewhere. And I was a little apprehensive. Where I was was pretty nice. You know, where am I going? What's this like? Oh God. So I entered into this physical world, this physical, I mean, this uh, solar system, uh, still with no awareness of myself, but feeling more and more like I've got some separate, independent existence somewhere down here. I think that's where I'm headed to. And then I covered over Austin and saw my body in the middle of the concrete, these people screaming at all this scene, and I thought, that's me. And I jumped back into my body. And the first thing I opened my eyes, I saw this red hair hanging down on my face. This driver had hopped out of the car. He was scared to death. He was screaming. Man, I tried to stop. I couldn't stop. And, then, and I, where I've just been, looking around, are all these panicked people and screaming. Hell, I've just been to heaven. This didn't bother me at all. I jumped to my feet and started trying to talk to these people. I, the car was all totaled. I didn't hurt at all. I never felt so good in my life. Now imagine if you're a witness and you're watching this stuff. And you see this guy praying and crying and talking to something ain't there and getting hit by a car and everybody rushes to help and he jumps up on his feet and says, oh, I feel fine. Did y'all see these monitors? Well, I didn't float. <laughs> you know, in no time they had cops there and ambulance. And they were comparing notes on the story and I kept telling them, you know, the witnesses told him the same thing, you know, hey, he's talking to shoot something ain't there. Uh, well, they took me to the hospital, couldn't keep me because I wasn't hurt. I had one little scratch on my head. But uh, while I'm at the um, hospital, 
uh, after they x-rayed me and I talked to doctors and nurses and told them what happened, of course nobody believes this. Not, I wouldn't either. Hell no, I wouldn't believe it. It's a nutcase, right? Which I can make, but this time it was really real. Uh, so, uh, there was a man walking toward me in casual clothes and I had seen premonitions of him before. I had actually seen premonitions of this whole event in the week leading up to it. I saw lights and cars and people screaming. I couldn't put it together. Hell, I couldn't put together what was going on in that second, let alone all these other flashes. But when I'm at the hospital and I'm still pumped up with adrenaline and I'm still feeling things so strongly and this guy walks up and he's a psychiatrist and I told him all about his family or he'd going to college and he's just mind blown. How do you know this? I said, right down, Doc, I know everything. And he said, well, give me an example. So I tuned in and saw him changing the furniture last week with his kids and the wife came home and this cuts out on the floor space. And I told him that and just, how did you know that? I said, just like I told you. And I said, look, nobody's hurt. Can I go home? He goes, no, we just can't let you go home. I'm oh, sorry. You're, you're talking about, you know, this stuff in front of witnesses, and uh, we're going to have to commit you to a psychiatric hospital. Uh, well, I didn't care. And I really didn't care. I was in heaven. They put me in jail for 24 hours till they get my um, family to sign a protective order of custody. Put me in the psychiatric hospital. Um, and uh, my doctor was a uh, very fundamentalist, uh, real extreme Baptist, by the book psychiatrist. Well, he couldn't deal with me. Uh, it was more like me helping him. Every day but when he'd come in, before he'd come in, I'd write down on a sheet of paper and hand it to the nurse and seal it at the time he would come in. And the first day he came in, what's this? Would you write me a letter? I said, no, it's just a couple words. Read I'll read it later. I said, no, look at it now. Open up. 232, what does that mean? Look at your watch. Huh, that's a coincidence. Second day, there's even more of a coincidence. Third day, Gary, I don't read this anymore. <laughs> he could not deal with it. And I kept telling him, have you ever had a psychic experience? Oh, no. Have you? And then, you know, he talked about my history. Yeah, I've done a lot of LSD in my day. I grew up as a musician. He's darn right. I went through that whole period. And I asked him, I said, have you ever taken psychedelics? No. Have you ever had a psychic experience? No. Well, then I have both, and I know the difference. All due respect, seeing that you have no experience in either. <laughs> well, we got, it got kind of hard to deal with him. I was just too fiery. Uh, at the end of 10 days, they have all the psychiatrists get together in front of me and me discuss my story, and I told them, I ain't changing it. I'm not changing a word. This is what happened. You guys want to commit me for another 10 days or forever? I don't care. You want me to tell a different story? Tell me what you want me to say, but this is what happened. And you guys, as doctors, all look into this. Because half the people in there are having psychic spiritual experiences. Thank God science is looking at the connection now. And so anyway, they, they, I finally got released after 10 days. On April 1st, 2077, I had a relapse. My, my mom came down this time they took me to the state hospital. Same thing, I started feeling this escalating awareness of everything, uh, projecting, telling people right in front of me what's gonna happen, who's gonna walk through the door next, who's gonna call on the phone. I couldn't cut it off. It was so obvious. Uh, so I uh, did two tours in the 70s. Uh, I'm gonna be a little spoiler, tell y'all something that like, goes along with what Matt said. I felt like I was the luckiest person on the planet for what I'd gone through. I don't care if anybody believed me. I really did not. All I knew was I had taken a trip to heaven, which I didn't know anybody could do, and it radically changed my life. I had never felt so uh, liberated in the sense of, wow, we have more power than we even imagine. We really do. Uh, I started giving psychic readings after I got out of college. When I went through this in 1977, it confirmed to me how much we can read the signs. And that's one thing I hope people take out of this. It's not necessarily my story, but the fact that the universe is always talking to us. We're a part of it. When we allow ourselves to learn to read the signs, we grow, we evolve. It's always happening. It's not Everybody reads them a little different, just like everybody's 
your death experience or consciousness is, is different. And I wrote a book that's back in the back. I'm going to be around for a little bit. Second Eternity, if you want to. In the back there, I wrote another book about lithomancy, the psychic art of reading stones, a method I've learned. I've just got a minute or two, so I was going to open up real quick for a quick question. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, that's the reason I wrote it, to share the experience, you know, and to empower people to see the possibilities. We've got time for one more question, and yes, Eli, come. I'd like to know where you're at, like, right now, and if you ever learned to shut it off, or if you still have the same thing going on. Uh, yeah, I, I, I do still experience that. I consciously experience, and I ask people if you want to grow and evolve, consciously ask every day. I call my four fantastic four into play, Jesus Christ, I was raised Catholic, my two parents, the lady who taught me this. I feel them all the time. I do still do readings. I feel a lot of things all the time about uh, people and situations, but now it's controllable. It's not like all at once like it was 40 years ago. So yeah, I do feel it, but I consciously want to. I want to know for I'm sorry, would you repeat that quickly? <laughs> okay. Uh, he asked me if I still feel these things. Yes, I do. Um, but they're tempered. I can control them now. I don't, they're not bombarding me 24-7. I'll give you a real quick example. Um, Ten years ago, I was living with a roommate, and his mother was a very ill. She was in Dallas. And every weekend, he'd go up and talk to her and play guitar, and she eventually went into a coma. He'd still go up and play guitar and come back on Monday. One day, he left, and when, when he's driving off, I could feel that that's the last time he's going to have to go up there for this. She's going to pass away. I forgot about it. It's Friday afternoon. Sunday morning, in there cooking breakfast, and as clearly as I'm looking at Ed right here, his mother zoomed through the, the room, and she was in a very light blue, kind of like that dress, kind of sky blue, pretty. And she had this big uh, gold uh, necklace on, and she zoomed through. She felt like a teenager, and she said, I'm out of here. You understand. Explain to Stan. Well, and she was gone, and he called me within two minutes and said, my mom just passed away. Wow. When he came back to town, I explained to him about seeing her, and it kind of freaked him out, and a year later, he helped me move. I was moving from his house, he helped me move some stuff, and that subject came up again. He said, I can't believe you described her in perfect detail exactly the way she uh, dressed in the casket. I said, Stan, she came through and talked to me, so you would understand. Don't worry about it. She's in peace. So yeah, I get those all the time, but I practice, and I want to get them, and I want to be aware, because I want to learn more and think positive about that. Thank you, Ed. Thank you, man.